Amen. As we prepare to read God's word together, let us humble our hearts for a moment, a season of silent prayer and reflection and preparation. Lord, as we come to your word together, we do so confessing your faithfulness and our unfaithfulness. Lord, you call us to serve you free, freely and cheerfully, and so often we do that begrudgingly. We have to be dragged into your service kicking and screaming. Lord, you call us to forgive, and, and so often we hold on to past hurts, and bitterness, and even things that we think we've let go. Something happens, and it brings it to the forefront of our mind, and we find some little unformed corner of our soul. And so, God, we come before you as sinners in need of your grace. as people who are incomplete and broken, needing to be swallowed up in the fullness of your story and love. We come together praying for those who are struggling with the loss of loved ones this morning and seeking your face. God, as we prepare to climb this hill with Abraham this morning in your story, we pray that you would walk with us shape and mold us, chip away those parts of our soul that don't belong, that what's left might be more pleasing to you and obedient to your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Our reading this morning comes from a very familiar passage in Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 to 18. And my hope for us this morning as we read is that this passage might come off the flannel gram Sunday school board of our memory, and we might really feel and experience what it would be like to be living through these words. Genesis chapter 22, beginning in verse one, and as follows. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. And he said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac, and he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. And Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey, and I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son, and he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they went, both of them, together. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father. And he said, here I am, my son. And he said, behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them together. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to, to him, for now I know that you fear God, seeing that you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. 
And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies and in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. The word of the Lord given graciously unto us. The story of God's work through Abraham is one of the greatest narratives preserved in all the scriptures, one of the greatest narratives preserved in all of literature. An unseen God called this man from Ur to leave his home and family of origin and to start a journey to a place that he had never seen. Though this man and his wife were older and had no children, God promised to make him fruitful and produce through him a mighty nation of descendants and through him to bless the whole world. Abraham was far from perfect. But this God of promise called and he obeyed. Through the ups and downs of the story of Abraham's walk with God, we see a heart of faith propelling the narrative so much so that years later, the writer of the book of Hebrews included Abraham's story in Hebrews chapter 11, what is now known by many as the hall of fame of faith in our New Testament. Finally, after many years of childlessness, God blessed Abraham and Sarah in their old age with a son. Commentator Kurt Strassner imagines that by this point in the story, Abraham and Sarah had finally kind of settled in. Their days of wandering around and living in makeshift tents had ended. Strassner imagines the setting. Sarah had probably finally gotten their home decorated just the way she liked it. Perhaps Abraham had planted a little garden in the backyard that he enjoyed tending. The servants had learned the ins and outs of the surrounding hillsides, perfecting the seasonal roots of cattle driving and shepherding in that region. And best of all, there was Isaac, this child of laughter that God had given them in the twilight of their life. Isaac was becoming a young man. He had proven to be a faithful and obedient son. He was learning to worship the God of his father. His shoulders were growing broad and his face was becoming like that of a man. Everything seemed to be going just right after all of their wandering. And then we come to chapter 22 of Genesis, which begins with God calling Abraham to climb up the mountain and sacrifice his son. Now, if I was Abraham, I imagine my response would have sounded something like, excuse me, what? I must have misunderstood. Or maybe you've got the wrong number, God. I'm Abraham, the one you've called your friend. I'm the guy who's obeyed every step of the way without complaint. And now you've asked me to do what? Just who do you think you are? We can easily imagine Abraham having all those kinds of questions, and and maybe he did. We have to imagine it because the text doesn't tell us. The story simply highlights Abraham's faithful obedience even to this absurd request from God. Verse 3 says even that Abraham arose early in the morning to begin this journey. Whatever hesitation he must have felt didn't dissuade him from getting right on this task from God. There's two statements from Abraham that drive this intensely emotional narrative forward as we read. The first comes in response to Isaac's million dollar question in verse seven. They're walking up the mountain and he says, Dad, I, I see the wood. 
I see the fire. I notice that you're holding a knife. But where is the lamb? What exactly are we going to sacrifice at the top of this hill? Probably from this moment forward, Isaac sleeps with one eye open in his home. Abraham's powerful response shows the depth of his great faith. He says, Elohim will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. God will provide. And then after the passage comes to its beautiful climax with Isaac's great deliverance, Abraham named the place, the Lord will provide, Yahweh Yaira, and it's that Hebrew form of this place name that we're considering together today, this hallowed name of God, Yahweh Yaira, the Lord who provides. In his earlier statement to Isaac and in that great place name, we see how Abraham was able to say to his servants, you guys stay here with the donkey and I and the boy will go over there and worship and come back again to you. As he climbed Mount Moriah with his son, Abraham was confident that God would one way or another meet every need along the way. Abraham was able to press forward even though he couldn't begin to understand what God was asking him to do because he trusted God. He believed in God's providence. He must have reasoned, God's been good to me up to this point. He's never let me down. He's never failed me. He's promised to bless my name and to multiply those, my descendants. And Isaac is the child of promise that he's given to me in my old age. And so somehow, in some way, if I'll just be obedient, he'll find a way to work it out. He's Yahweh Ira, the God, the Lord who provides. So Abraham obeyed faithfully, and sure enough, When push came to shove, the angel of the Lord stopped him at the exact moment, and behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. I'm really grateful when when I read this that Abraham wasn't hard of hearing, right? Abraham, Abraham. But he heard, right? And he, he obeyed. He stopped at just the right time. And sure enough, just when it was needed, there was that ram caught in the thicket. Derek Kidner calls this name Yahweh Yaira, the Lord will provide Abraham's lifelong motto that we would all do well to emulate. Kidner says it's Abraham's complete certainty of God coupled together with his complete openness to detail that makes this the desired response in our walk with the Lord. Abraham was able to trust that God, was a, God would provide what was needed and that he was, faith, he was faithful enough to leave all the details in the hands of Yahweh Yaira. I, I think most of us are faithful to be obedient to God and follow God wherever he leads as long as it's not somewhere dangerous or icky or scary, Right? We're faithful to give up whatever God wants us to give up as long as he he gives us in full detail exactly how he wants us to do that and where he wants us to do that and when when we'll have fulfilled that task. God, we'll be obedient to you in everything. We just want you to spell out for us exactly what it is that you're doing and going to do in our midst. That's not at all how Abraham responded. Abraham's story shows us that when God's people respond in faithful obedience, leaving the details in the hands of the Lord one way or another, the Lord will always provide for his people. I can't help but think of this passage whenever our budget and finance committee is preparing the church's annual budget or dealing with some little wrinkle that comes up during the year or coming before us with a special need. I've been in several different churches along the way, and the the process takes many different forms, but basically it goes something like this. We feel like God is calling us to do these things, and then we look at the bottom line, and we see that we don't have money for any of those things, and we have to struggle through how to figure that out. 
We'll wrestle through them many different ways. We can rearrange our priorities and we'll tighten our belt in all sorts of different ways, a good discipline for us corporately and for our individual families. And then eventually we'll step back and basically decide that one way or another, we'll figure out a way to lead the congregation to climb whatever mountain we feel like God has called us to climb together and that we'll trust whatever we need will be provided by his hand at the right time and in the right place. I have to admit that process feels quite unnerving every time. But every time we've ever stepped out in faith to try and obey the call of God, at just the right time, we found a ram in the thicket that could only have come from God himself. How does that even make sense? Why does God's church tend to function like that so often? Why do things tend to happen like that in our individual lives of faith? I think things tend to work out like that in God's kingdom because he's Yahweh Ira the Lord who provides. See, he never promised to be the Lord who will tell us every detail we need to know way in advance. He didn't ever say, I'm the God who's not gonna lead you out on a ledge. I'm the God that's not gonna lead you out far on the branch. I'm, he's never said, I, I'm the God who's never gonna ask you to step off a cliff. He says, I'm Yahweh, Yaira. I'm the Lord who provides. I call, you obey, and I'll take care of it. I think just about every family that ever commits to be faithful stewards of life, whatever that looks like in our story, whether we're called to simply serve the Lord in some way, whether we're called at that moment to tithe, to honor God, in any other way, that when when we make that decision to be faithful stewards of life, that we tend to go through a struggle like this at some point in our story. We look at our busy schedule and we say, we know God wants something more from us but there's just no time for anything else. How are we ever gonna fit faithful worship participation and any kind of church ministry into this crazy life that we live? But in the end, if we'll step out in faith and learn to say no to some of the things that are clamoring for our attention and to obey God's call in our lives, we will somehow meet Yahweh Ira along the way. We look at our finances and the struggle to pay our own bills and we think, God, I, I know you've called me to honor you with my first fruits, but it's just not there. I know what your word says, I, I know what your call is, but I can do math, and it just doesn't add up. But time and again, if we'll rearrange our priorities and commit to say, God, I'm going to give you what's yours first, no matter what, we will come to know the Lord who provides in so many different ways along the journey. When we decide that God is good, even when he seems to be calling us to an impossible task, when we choose to obey God, even when the path he calls us to walk seems to be going in an absurd direction, when we opt for faithfulness, even when faithfulness doesn't make any sense, we will discover that at just the right time, God always seems to have a lamb caught in the thicket for his people in their obedience. We discover that God really is that good, good father that we sing about, who has a good plan and purpose for his children. The other day, Adam Ortiz was telling me about his conversation with a friend about church, he was talking to a non-church-going friend about his church experience, and he said that his friend just couldn't comprehend the concept of stewardship. His friend asked, now, you volunteer with the children's ministry at your church? Yes, I volunteer. I volunteer there. And you give part of your paycheck each week to your church? You let them draw it from your account? Why? Why? Adam said that he tried to explain that he he loves God and he loves his church and he even goes to lunch with the pastor every once in a while, which we need to do uh, again soon, Adam. But that friend just struggled to comprehend the concept. He, he He couldn't figure it out. It didn't compute. And I think that's because God's providence 
is impossible to appreciate adequately as a secondhand experience. Hear that again. God's providence is impossible to appreciate adequately as a secondhand experience. Somebody else's story of how God provides just isn't quite enough. It's something we have to experience firsthand. There, there's a really interesting kind of obscure Hebrew phrase at the end of verse 14 that helps us begin to understand, I think, why that is. Uh, the verse says, So Abraham called the name of that place Yahweh Yaira, the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, on the mount of Yahweh, it shall be provided, it shall be Yaira. And Yaira is the word that throughout this passage is translated as provide, but it's actually literally a seeing word. The idea is that God will see to the needs of Abraham and Isaac in his time and his way. And that ultimately that God will see to the needs of all of his people. And then it's that phrase at the end of verse 14 that, that kind of has two ideas in mind at the same time in the Hebrew that's kind of hard to translate into English. It has both the idea that God will see to our needs and somehow also it's the idea that God himself will be seen in that process. We can't really understand that, I don't think, unless we've experienced it. And it happens so often. We, we, we try to be obedient to God, and in that process, God sees our needs, and, and God meets our needs, and somehow as he does that, we get the chance to see God. We catch a little glimpse of God's glory and how he takes care of us when we simply obey. It's hard to explain that to someone who's on the outside looking in. Maybe it's impossible to explain that to someone who's on the outside looking in. But when we're faithful to answer the call of God, we experience that again and again and again in our walk of faith. That doesn't mean that things always work out the way we want them to. We don't wake up one day and say, you know what, I would like a new car. And so from this day forth, I'm going to be really obedient to God and he's going to give me my new car just doesn't work like that. No matter what, anybody on television will tell you. Lottie Moon, who we talk about a lot at Christmas because our Christmas offering is named for her, is maybe the most faithful missionary this side of the Apostle Paul. She was a missionary in China for over 40 years. Throughout that time of great service to the Lord on the mission field, sharing God's goodness in word and deed, she faced plague, Famine, revolution, and the horrors of war. Famine and disease took their toll all around her and, and in her life. When Moon returned from her second furlough in 1904, she was deeply struck by the suffering of the people who were literally starving to death all around her. And, and so she pleaded for more money and more resources from the mission organization in the U.S., but the mission board was heavily, heavily in debt. There just wasn't more money to send, and so mission salaries were voluntarily cut. And unknown to her fellow missionaries, Moon shared her personal finances and food with anyone in need around her, severely affecting both her physical and mental health. In 1912, she weighed only 50 pounds. Alarmed fellow missionaries arranged for her to be sent back to the U.S. with a missionary companion, but she died en route at age 72 in the harbor of Kobe, Japan, having withered away to almost nothing. God didn't deliver Lottie Moon from struggles or even pro provide enough food to keep her from starving. But we can just imagine the bountiful feast that she now enjoys at Jesus' table seated alongside who knows how many Chinese sisters and brothers that came into God's family through her witness. So one way or another, in this life or the next, the Lord answers our prayers and provides for his people. On several occasions the past few weeks, I, I've had the opportunity to visit with different precious servants of God's kingdom in our church who are going through serious struggles and tests of different kinds. And in all those stories, I found myself saying, I just can't imagine that this is the last chapter of the story God is writing in your life. I think that's an important hope to cling to when we're facing the great trials of this life. 
that God is doing something in our life and that his ultimate purpose is good. So no matter what we're going through, we can press forward in faith and obedience, trusting that Yahweh, Yairo, will provide what's needed for us to get through this and even to overcome. Abraham and Isaac had far more at stake in this passage than finances or even daily bread. The call of God builds an intensity as God says, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love. That's not an abstract request. God was asking Abraham to sacrifice what was most precious to him to offer back with an open hand all the promises upon which his whole life had been based. Abraham obeyed in faith, and God proved himself again to be Yahweh Yireh, the Lord who provides. What will we do if faithfulness becomes more than an abstract concept for us this week or in the coming months? What will we do if God calls us to sacrifice something tangible, something that matters? How will we respond to a call like the one Abraham faced in this passage? What will we say if God calls one of our children to carry the gospel to a very dangerous place? What will we do if being faithful to Christ means losing our job, forfeiting our health, or endangering our family? Those are the kinds of questions we have to ask in order to really begin to wrestle through the test that stood before Abraham and Isaac on Mount Moriah. Because faithful stewardship is about so much more than our money, so much more than our stuff, so much more than our finances. How are we gonna raise our kids? How are we gonna live in our home? How are we gonna conduct our business in this world? Are we gonna hold something back in these or other areas? Or are we going to be completely obedient to the call of God in everything? Will we cling to the things we love with a tight fist? Or will we, like Abraham in this passage, be willing to say, God, your promise is secure and I trust you. I'll do whatever you've called me to do. I'll go wherever you've called me to go. I'll give up whatever you've called me to give up I'll take on whatever challenge you lay before me, no matter how crazy it seems. Because I know that you're indeed Yahweh, Yaira, the Lord who provides. I know you're the God who sees my need and will move heaven and earth to meet it, if I'll but obey. Many ages after this encounter with God on Mount Moriah, on a nearby hill that came to be known as Golgotha, This story played out far differently as God offered his only son, Jesus, as a sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Jesus was the ultimate lamb in a thicket whose sacrifice took our place. In Jesus, we discover once and for all that God is Yahweh, Yaira, the Lord who provides. Because of what God has done for us in Christ, we can truly follow wherever he leads faithfully joining in the prayerful words of Messianic Jews, Bari K. Mallon, and Shmuel Wolkenfeld. Lord, how grateful I am for your hand of provision. You give and you withhold, all for my best. You call me to obey, not to sacrifice. Yahweh Yaira, how I praise you for providing beyond what I could hope for, dream of, or ask. Sometimes I feel like I'm being backed into a corner with nowhere to go. And that's exactly the time you always come through for me. How wonderful it is to even know you. And all of God's people said, amen. Maybe this morning, you feel the call of of God on your life. This morning, you would say that up to this point, your story of faith has been kind of a secondhand one. You've heard of people that follow God, and that sounds somewhat appealing, but you've never known what it is to live knowing that this God, whose story we celebrate in worship, 
is with you as you go throughout your week. That this story of Jesus is more than a tale told long ago, but it's the defining narrative of your days. I invite you to come. And come to know this God in a personal way for the rest of your life. This God who leads and calls and often asks us to step off a cliff to do scary, exciting, terrifying things for the glory of his kingdom. This morning, for the first time, you would say, I'm ready, I'm ready to obey. I want to follow him. I want to leave here with a first-hand faith. I invite you to come. Maybe today you're a believer, but you would say that you tend to respond to the call of God more like me than like Abraham. You say, God, I'll do whatever you want as long as it's not scary. I'll give whatever you want as long as it's not money. I'll be obedient as long as it doesn't interfere with my tea time. But you want to leave here saying, you know what? I'm willing to follow God if he leads into the fire. I'd rather go into the dark with God than to go into the light on my own. I want to leave here knowing that if God says jump, I'm going to be saying, God, how high? And trust him to catch me if he wants me to stay for longer than I can. You come with open hands saying, God, here's everything I have. Here's everything I am. Here's everything I hope to be. And I just trust you to do better with it than I can do by myself. Maybe today you would come and make this your church home where together we seek to serve Yahweh Yaira, the God who always provides so that others might see that service and come to find his providence for themselves. You respond to God's spirit however he leads your heart as we stand and we sing together.